the more frequently you can train aerobically, um, the better. And, and, you know, I'd say there's no such thing as sort of too slow or, or, I mean, maybe not exactly too short, but, you know, 20 or 30 minutes is still um, going to add up. That triathlon show, 172. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I have a really, really amazing interview in store for you. I'm super excited. Uh, It's with Coach Joel Filial, who is one of the most successful elite triathlon coaches in the history of the sport, I think it's safe to say. He has his own multinational squad of elite athletes that he coaches. Currently, some of the most well-known names in that squad include world champion Mario Mola, world number two Katie Zafiris, world number two Vincent Louis, Jake Berthwistle, Martin Van Riel, and others. And uh, in the past, he has coached athletes like, for example, Simon Whitfield, who took the Olympic silver medal in Beijing 2008 while being coached by Joel. Uh, Joel is also currently working as the Olympic Performance Director for the Italian Triathlon Federation, and uh, in the past he has worked as uh, the head coach for British Triathlon, and in that role worked with, among others, athletes like the Brownlee brothers, and he has worked in various roles for Triathlon Canada as well. Before we get into the interview, big thanks to today's sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration. And uh, as uh, you've heard probably many times already, when we talk about hydration, it's not just about fluid replacement, but sodium replacement as well, because that plays a critical role. And the interesting thing is that the difference in the amount of sodium that people lose in their sweat can be quite huge. Some people might lose 200 milligrams of sodium per liter of sweat, and some people might lose over 2,000 milligrams. And then when you consider that people can have different sweat rates, then you see that these differences and uh, individual considerations, they add up very, very quickly. And that's why Precision Hydration, they have positioned themselves to not just provide uh, the products, the hydration products and uh, the sodium replacement products, but also provide the knowledge and uh, the consultancy to allow you to to get to know more about how you should hydrate. So what they did was they created a free online sweat test that is based on a great amount of actual sweat test data with medical grade equipment. And uh, this free sweat test has been validated against that. And uh, you can just quickly answer 10 questions or so in an online quiz and get a very good estimate for how much you sweat and how much sodium you lose in your sweat. And of course, you get a free hydration strategy uh, as a result. And uh, this will allow you to to tackle your next race, being very prepared and knowing what to do when it comes to hydration. If you want to uh, try Precision Hydration's hydration products, use the promo code ADETTRIATHLONSHOW, all one word, all caps, to get your first box for free on precisionhydration.com. And of course, before you do that, take that free online sweat test to know which electrolyte strength you should go for. And big thanks to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka is the world leading manufacturer in triathlon apparel, wetsuits and performance eyewear. Uh, They invest a lot in R&D and one of the main victories of that R&D is the arms up technology that they created for their wetsuits which results in greater flexibility and mobility on the swim than uh, than with any other wetsuit and this arms up technology exists in all of their wetsuits from the entry level to the very high end wetsuits but interestingly they also use a modified arms up technology in their triathlon suits because when they they thought that hey if we're actually using a tri suit or we we wear a tri suit under the wetsuit, 
So if that dry suit restricts mobility, then maybe that wet suit mobility doesn't count for as much. So so they added that modified arms app technology to the tri suits as well uh, to make sure that you have no restrictions from uh, from that aspect. So when you use a Roka wetsuit and a tri suit, you can be sure that your mobility is going to be excellent and your swim is not going to be restricted by mobility or flexibility. This sort of performance thinking and really striving for excellence is present in all of Roka's products. And that's why I think that they're such a great company and I, I really admire uh, what they do and, and all their products. You can get 20% off your entire order on roka.com or their EU or UK websites that you can navigate to from that roka.com main page with the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. So the interview today is quite long. It is, in fact, very long compared to uh, what they usually are, but it's as long as it needed to be, not a uh, a second longer. So enjoy this great chat and all the fantastic advice that you will get from Coach Joel Filial. Today's guest on That Triathlon Show is uh, Joel Filial. Joel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you, and uh, it's also great to have you perhaps back uh, with the, your own podcast, uh, the Real Coaching Podcast, which uh, uh, I enjoyed while it was going on a couple of years ago, and, and now you've done a couple of episodes again. So uh, uh, I guess you can tell us a bit uh, what's the plan with with that podcast going forward. Are you going to to continue to do that regularly? Yeah, cer- certainly. It's it's my intention. Um, no, I, I've in, I've enjoyed doing it, and. Um, had some good uh, interaction and questions and like anything like that it gets you to think um about different topics so it's got a a personal interest as well as sharing information about what we're doing and how i think about the sport yeah definitely and actually a lot of the the topics that i have for today are from uh, an episode that you did which was basically a q a episode uh with a lot of questions and, and many of these questions are things that stood out to me from from your answers to those questions so uh, uh, let's just start with the the first thing that i that i noted here which was uh, that you really emphasize keeping things simple and avoiding major mistakes so can you talk a little bit about that and how how that's uh, a big part of your philosophy yeah i think you know in the proliferation of of information and sports science and just the evolution of a young sport like triathlon. Um, well, you've, even you might argue in, in general in, in the world today, that we have so much information. And I think, you know, being able to filter that and to understand what's important is, is key, you know, finding wisdom in this, in this data, in this information and, and all of the, the choices that we have to make. What do we pay attention to? Uh, what's really important? Um, and what's not what are distractions and and i feel like this concept of of keeping simple has never been more relevant than now of you know what actually makes a difference what is like a distraction um what can you implement consistently over time as a coach or as an athlete uh, what has real value um so i i keep coming back to that trying to filter uh, what's really important and um, it, it's not easy um, it you know we're surrounded by new technology um, the ability to measure things has never been easier the ability to collect data has never been easier and finding really the value is is probably never been harder than 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 now and and so I, you know I remind myself and in my daily work you know what? What are the essentials here? What What's important? And and so I come back to that that concept of, of keeping it simple. And and there's a tendency to want to make things you know appear sophisticated, and we maybe get a go along with some of the other um, points in in the in the discussion. But but that keeping well, it simple. Well, if, if you want if you want to give a couple of examples or or even just one example of of something that you think in. Uh, that today is, uh, I guess, becoming popular or getting r- riding the the hype curve, so to say. Mm. Uh, do, do you have any examples of of that that you want to point out? Well, probably the 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 one that immediately comes to mind is is athlete monitoring or workload monitoring, and and what what's what's real there, and 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 um, you know, I suppose 
it's always useful to think about well, what context are you working in as a coach? Because not everyone is is working in the same context. So there are you know perhaps different tools you might use uh, in different contexts. But but what I always come back to is um, you know paying attention to the athletes and and their mood, their how they're how they're um, how they're behaving kind of every day you know i watch them walking to the pool i watch their uh, their joking around and laughing and so i have that everyday context that that perhaps not everyone has if you're working remotely or you're not sort of on deck um but but paying attention to that stuff you know is really effective and and we've seen this in even when when it's been you know various athlete monitoring recovery monitoring there's I mean, none of this stuff is particularly new. You know, we can go back to, you know, m- measuring, uh, you know, morning heart rate and, you know, what, what what did we have when it was simpler, when we had more simple tools um, to more sophisticated tools now. But, you know, what seems to be just really effective is asking athletes how they're doing. How do they feel? What's, you know, do they have any soreness? Are they tired? You know, this just really simple stuff of interacting with, with people uh, I think is still the most effective, and and this is borne out in in various um, ways that you can measure this if it's possible to measure this. Um, yeah, but, and, and I guess to, to be clear to be clear for the listeners, I, I think that you refer to things like, for example, measuring a, a chronic training load and and things like that, and and perhaps HRV and and other sort of measurables, uh, and and those sort of things that are that are perhaps over complicating things versus asking the athlete how they feel are, are there, just to make things concrete for for listeners are those a couple of examples of, of what you consider workload monitoring yeah i mean I, I think my first thought was about recovery monitoring so you know various ways to measure that from you know there's all kinds of ways you can measure that but you know hrv is one more you know technological way to to look at that uh, like I said, morning heart rate, or you know, even questionnaires, or you know, apps asking how they're feeling. Um, you know, even in um, one one really in, interesting and very simple way um, in in Training Peaks is sort of the um, the, the the application Training Peaks is the implementation of this sort of RPE thing, which is just a, a, a motocon and um, like the the beautiful simplicity of of that. You know, you get a smiley face or a sad face, and and actually, it's pretty useful. You know, um, in, in the in, in in as a as a data point. But of course, what's really interesting um, in my work is seeing the athletes in, in person and talking to them. You know, so that I think that's never going to go out of style. I mean, you always want to find other ways of understanding how they are, but but mood and. Um, and body language and just general their perception of their energy is is a holistic uh, way to look at where they're at. I think where you're going also, you know, with cr- measuring workload, I differentiate that um, to kind of readiness to train and, and recovery. Uh, workload, we've got, you know, a ton of ways to measure that and accessibility that we never used to have. Um, but then, of course, we generate significant amounts of data with that and um and you know i find myself still kind of coming back to really just simple metrics of you know hours time spent um obviously it it doesn't have the fine detail of the type of work done but at a glance it's still pretty effective um just for even the simple reason that our our technology is not terribly reliable at the point yet you know, I, I mean, G- GPS uh, is 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 pretty consistent. Although obviously the athlete has to remember to wear their devices or charge them. Um, and uh, but you know, even even power. You know, I've got. I mean, on any given day, somebody's power meter is not working. And so you know, here we are. You know, um, it's 2019, and and you know, a lot of this stuff. I mean, it's I guess both technology in general doesn't isn't always reliable or or um, rock solid. And you know, you, as soon as you know, you introduce holes in your data. Um, you know, stuff like the chronic training load. You know, where you gotta pay attention. Is it 
correct? Is it close enough? Is it, you know, how many holes are in there? Um, glitches, you know, that, that takes a lot of um, attention uh, to, to understand if, you know, how accurate it is, how useful it is it even. Um, you know, we might take a look at chronic training load, um, of course, and, and have the understanding of how we can put data together over time and, and understand, you know, acute and chronic and, you know, that the balance between, uh, between those. Um, but, but I, you know, I find myself coming back to, you know, how many Ks did we do? How many hours did we do? Um, is, does that get us the essentials? And, and often, uh, I think it does. It doesn't tell us always all the quality, but I find, um, it's still pretty good keeping it simple in that way. Yeah. And especially when you have that, uh, that relationship with the athlete and you know what kind of training that you're giving them so you know whether you're giving 15 hours a week of uh, that, that's perhaps not for you with the elite squad mm. let's say 30 hours per week of uh, easier training or if it's 25 hours of uh, pretty pretty intense training so so you already have that context of the the intensity i guess the intensity profile of the training if somebody is coming to you cold and saying that they do you know nothing about them and, and they say that oh, I'll train 25 hours a week, that's perhaps not uh, not going to directly tell you what uh, how, how much that really is or how hard that workload is. But but when you have the context of being the coach of the athlete, then then it absolutely hours is uh, really fundamental. And uh, as you say, for various reasons, it's it's less sensitive to errors mm. than than the other sources of work it's, it's interesting when, when you just say that it made me think of you know when i when i look at a, an athlete's program if they say let's say they say they do 30 hours a week um there's different kinds of 30 hours a week but you can tell by looking how much time are they inputting for um like swim sessions for example you know we've i've got the you know i've seen the the two hour 5k swims or the one hour 15 5k swims you know how how much you know if you're doing that six times a week and you're 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 adding an extra 30 to 45 minutes every time that's probably not reality then it's easy to to pad those numbers or or how much you know gym time is actually workload versus you know sitting sitting down on a mat um for example but but yeah you could you know it doesn't take too long to dig into context and and you know i mean the question that when i think about so how, how many weeks did you do x hours you know um that that you know that that's more interesting to me than than um, you know the one offs. So as you say, when you dig into the context, you can start to see what's going on. But you know, if somebody tells me they're training consistently at thirty hours a week, I've got an idea of what 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 they can what they're doing uh, in any case, and and it you know it automatically says something about the training load that they're doing. Uh, it's not a fine detail, but I mean, again, the question is like, what what's enough detail to make decisions, and how deep do you need to dig uh, in order to understand, you know, what to do, what decisions to make, how you know how to proceed. Um, but as you said, the, the context with if you're actually coaching these athletes, then you know, then then all of these uh, points mean something, and and um, uh, and and you learn to understand what to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah, and for a self coach athlete, hopefully they they have uh, a grasp of their their own context as well, because a lot of the listeners, of course, are self coach athletes. So, uh, so then uh, that that just goes to say that yeah, I mean those simple traditional things like hours and kilometers are are not not, not to be snuffed at. Uh, let's talk about uh, the go be a bit deeper, I guess, into workload because that's another point that uh, I heard you make about. Uh, consistent total workload over time and across disciplines being uh, one of, if not the biggest factor behind improvement in endurance sports. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a, it's a good segue from where we just were, you know, um, I think in endurance sport, um, I think because probably because of the ability to measure things um, outside of the lab um, and, and, you know, we essentially have mobile ergometers on our bikes and, and we've got, you know, data from every run that we do now. It, it's things have trended towards, I think, more focus on intensity. And you could probably say this even across sports. And, and as, as we've understood, you know, the, the impact of intensity and the, the, you know, even, even more in triathlon, the, the specificity of intensity, 
uh, there's big, been this focus on on that, you know, focus on sort of key workouts, you know, quote unquote key workouts. What are what are your key workouts? And trying to understand even the whole concept of key workouts, you might say, is a misnomer. There, there's no such thing as really a key workout that is unlocks the the program or unlocks success. Um, but in fact, it's you know my my view and my experience, it's that that workload over time or that chronic training load over time is is uh, a big driver of of uh, ult- ultimately your success and achieving your potential and you know underpinning that it, it's the it's the volume and frequency that that is the biggest impact you know um, I'll take an athlete who primarily trains you know easy but with relatively high volume and frequency uh, over you know a, a reverse to that of fairly high intensity but lower volume um i think we can't escape um uh, I, I guess a critical volume if you like um over time as a as a driver of a aerobic endurance sport um yes we know that it's the impacts of you know high intensity training and race pace training but we also, how I see it is, you can only do so much of that, and if, you're, if it's not underpinned by by f- frequent easy training, frequent frequent low intensity training over time, then you know that I guess I think of it as like a foundation underneath. I mean, maybe a quite traditional aerobic base way of thinking about it, but you know, I think actually that's the fundamental thing that we're trying to do, and um, you know, it's. We we you started by asking what you know, major mistakes and is keep uh, re- relating to keeping things simple and and I think the major error um, that we're all we all tend towards because of the the you know, variety of factors which we might talk about including ego it is just about intensity and then do, overdoing intensity and overdoing uh, race pace sessions and overdoing race specificity. Uh, it's tempting to to think about the most direct route, you know, to um, to getting where we want to go, or at least it it intuitively may think, seem like that uh, in the most specific way. If you want to get better at, you know, running uh, whatever pace for your 10k, then you should practice running that pace more often. But actually, that's perhaps not the best way. And and certainly, you know, what what I've come to understand is is the higher intensities have you know there's a tolerance to how much you can do and and you might even say a toxicity to to too much you know too much makes you ill or or makes you you know has has a negative impact and so you know i think even when we're thinking self-coached or even recreational like age group or serious age group um you know compared to elite you know there's still a maximum tolerance you know the elites don't necessarily do massively more intensity uh, or volume of, of race specific intensity or, or faster than race pace. Um, they don't necessarily do any more, you know, there's a certain amount you can do and recover from. And it's the rest of the training that's then kind of interesting is how much volume can you consistently do while you're doing uh, race, race intensity or higher intensity and how much of that do you do? But, you know, I always come back to, you know, frequency consistent, volume over time and um that just means to me um you know for first bu- building up you know how many times you're training per week in each sport mostly easy um build the total volume mostly easy start to add um uh, work like hills and 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 lower intensity uh, lower than race pace I, I think you can do a lot with un- under race pace or under uh, threshold which ha- however you think about various thresholds you can do a lot with going under you don't need to do a lot uh, over but uh, it's so tempting to want to do those um, high intensity sessions but maybe to, to demonstrate to yourself that you're getting fitter or to prove to yourself or test yourself but uh, of course the the irony there is if you do too much testing you inevitably compromise your chronic training load so you're actually compromising that consistency yeah, yeah, and I also think another reason that uh, that high intensity is, is so popular is that it's it's fairly simple to to study compared to, for example, mm. low uh, low intensity, high volume training over a long time. That that would be very difficult to to study in comparison to a six week interval training program. So so that that might be another 
another thing there. Uh, when you mentioned the, the critical threshold of, of volume, how do you uh, do you have a, an idea of what that might be for somebody who is looking to be, uh, because you're working obviously with with elite uh, ITU uh, draft legal athletes. So so for that demographic, what do you see as the the critical threshold of volume? Is it uh, can can you say anything about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's not a precise figure, yeah. but in, in, and I would say even there's a there's a range of um, you know what you might consider you know highly successful individuals are doing, and and actually there was um, a presentation at uh, the INSEP conference. Um, it was it was put on by the ITU a few years ago in Paris, and I think all of these presentations may be online, although I'm not sure this one is. By this was by Sergio Santos, a Portuguese coach, um, and he compared the training weeks of a number of different programs and athletes, and and it was interesting because most of them were fairly similar. You know, you know, over or under 30 hours, you might say that you know the low end would might be. 25 hours uh, per week and the high end might be 35 hours per week. So that, I mean, that's already a pretty big range, but you know, this, you know, the sweet spot being in there, depending how much intensity you use, really, I think that that ends up being what the, you know, uh, how much you can do is going to depend a lot on that. Um, You know, the first thing to fall away when you're fatigued is, is you can't do the intensity that you want. So, you know, if you, if you, you know, you might find even, I mean, this could be an interesting point for development uh, of athletes is, you know, should you prioritize doing the, the race pace intensity or, or the volume? Uh, because young athletes, you tend to find they can't do both. So what, what can they do compared to senior athletes? They can do one or the other, not, not usually both at the same time. And that's ultimately the differentiator. Um, you know, when, when a new athlete comes to a program, you know, can, you know, typically they, they, if they haven't done the volume then they're going to struggle to, to be able to do that. But what would we see, what we would see is they would not be able to do the intensity as well, um, through the, through the, the week, uh, and months as, as a more senior athlete. So the senior athletes can recover from, 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 uh, the general volume and be able to be consistent. So, but coming back to that, like that concept of a critical volume, I, you know that I don't know if that's that helpful to think of it in in that way, um, but yeah, it, it it's going to range. Probably not too many top level endurance, uh, even in well, I, short course in Ironman doesn't I don't think differentiate that much in volume. But it's probably not too many less than twenty four twenty five hours twenty four hours, you know per per week. And and of course we're talking somewhat consistently. You know it's not going to be every week all year, um, but you know, over time, how many of those weeks are you stacking together, you know, as a, as a sense of that, that volume. And I think if you're too low on that side, if you, if you get below that 24, 25 hours, too many weeks in the year, um, you know, I, I think you may have issues achieving your ultimate potential. And, and I think you need a certain amount of that. And we, and we saw this kind of discussion in athletics um, over the last 20 years that, you know, we've seen kind of a swing from, you know, a lot of speed work back to volume. I mean, it may, maybe started more on the volume side and, you know, the, the traditional sort of 100 miles a week or above. And but then it swung to kind of the, the trend, if you like, to being more focused on high intensity. And now it's probably the pendulum has swung back a little bit more um, towards towards volume but but in, in triathlon is a much younger sport and maybe more diverse than just distance running um, we've got all kinds of um, disciplines and and just not a long history so um but yeah coming back to that like i, I think you know even when it comes to uh, what do we mean by consistency and i was talking with a colleague today about consistency i think the everyone says consistency is important the word is perhaps lost its meaning or any kind of understanding what does that even mean what does it mean to be consistent you know um what what are we really talking about and at least how i think about it is the workload that we can sustain week after week without taking recovery weeks um that's what i'm looking for we're we, we've been here on since the beginning of january what are we the where the as we're speaking now 13, in the middle of february, february. 
Right. We've, we've not taken a recovery week and we're not going to take a recovery week. And the weeks that I w- the, the, vo- the workload that I want to do to be consistent has got to be sustainable over a long period of time. So we don't follow a periodization like, you know, the one, two, three, one week off, that kind of stuff. In my experience, and I've done all of that before, of course, as you develop and try different ways of periodizing training and, and understanding workload, you know, certainly practiced all that. But I found if, if you're desperately needing the, the recovery week, you know, in, in any kind of um, periodization or even in the shorter ones, if, if you're doing a three and one, three days in one, if you're if you're really desperately needing that one day or one week, the training the workload on those days is probably too high, and you're not going to be able to do that consistently. Um, you know, again, what what can you do sustainably? And it, of course, it doesn't mean that we don't adapt, and and that some athletes don't end up needing um, recovery um, uh, to be to be adapted. We change the program if they need it. But the goal is to try to make the workload consistent over that time. And, and the biggest impact of that is, is how much and the type of intensity that we do. Um, the more intensity that we do, the more likely that we're going to lose that consistency because if we overshoot a little bit, um, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect what they can do the following days. And I mean, th- this isn't like a formula that ever you totally figure out. I mean, it, it's a constant thing that's in flux all the time you can overshoot one session and and you know try to learn from that and and make a better decision in the moment the next time um there's not generally a problem with under underdoing it um it's not you know the the cost of underdoing workload either in a specific session or over time is is not a catastrophic problem but of course the opposite is is a catastrophic problem and so when we come back to you know, um, this consistency, what, what we're trying to avoid as well is, is um, interruptions in training due to illness and injury. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, short-term fatigue is just, you know, part of that, um, trying to avoid the, you know, heavy short-term fatigue. Uh, but that, that's what we're trying to avoid. And then that's the biggest killer of um, progression over time is, is when you've got, when you're forced to take time off due to training error and, and almost everything is training error. You know, we come back to, you know, basically all injuries, all injuries that are not uh, an acute event like crashing your bike or or another, you know, accident type thing are, are training load errors. And some people have, due to their biomechanics, have lower thresholds of, of tolerance and others much higher, but it's still you, you exceeded whatever tissue's ability to take the load uh, or your, you know, in another case, it could be, you know, immunity um, issues as well related to general stress from, from training or, or otherwise. So, you know, that, that's what we're trying to be able to do. Um, and as I say, you know, I don't think you ever have it totally figured out We're we're constantly tweaking and adjusting and, and monitoring and watching and listening and, and being willing to adapt um, you know, that this, I guess that's the coaching practice. If you like, you, you have to practice that because ultimately the decision-making, the daily decision-making is what coaching is about. Um, the physiology and all that's not so difficult. The decision-making is, is hard or it's harder to, to tread the line of, you know, what, what's the right thing? You know, when do you push on? When do you, do you back off? Um, you know what? What? Is, when is enough? Um, and when is when is uh, too much? And um, you know that that's that takes time to develop that. And and of course you have to understand the athletes. So I think the better we get at that, the more likely we're we're actually going to be consistent and um, have the least interruptions. And then ultimately that's going to give us the most predictable performance. I think. Yeah. Well, that, that was uh, that, that was a fantastic answer to to the question, and, and a lot of really really uh, gold golden nuggets in in there. I, I think the the one follow up that I, I will ask is: uh, Do you have any particular consideration that uh, for age group athletes uh, that are not training twenty five thirty hours per week that they should take from from this whole discussion and how they you should apply I- apply it? I guess I guess in in their lives and their training. Uh, you know, the first thing that comes to me is just frequency. You know, the, the more frequently you can train aerobically, um, the better. And, and 
you know, I'd say there's no such thing as sort of too slow or, or, I mean, maybe not exactly too short, but, you know, 20 or 30 minutes is still um, going to add up. You know, I don't, I don't think there's uh, any issue, you know, if you can, if you can fit in a 20 minute run, that's what you can do then. And you can add that in, then, you know, build towards that. I just think frequency for, you know, from the point of view of when you're getting fit, frequency is just really powerful. And um, the more you can do of that, like, you know, and just easy frequency, that is a starting point. You know, when, when I'm thinking about uh, anybody's, you know, current fitness level, what's the next step is often just to add frequency, um, then volume, then intensity. And intensity is just the least important, I think, of, of those. Of course, when you've got some race goals, you've got to progress towards, you know, being able to do the duration and, and, and do it at the pace you want. But, but, you know, it doesn't have to be all specific. And I think starting point with, you know, wherever you are now, you can probably add some frequency and, um, and that can help. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need a day off, for example, or multi, you know, or more than one day off, um, aerobic exercise, you can do something every day. And, and I think, I mean, we apply this with, with our, uh, elite athletes is, um, I prefer to, to spread out the training over the week rather than have particular days off. And, um, and that can be effective for anyone, you know, um, rather than try to do the same volume in six days, we can do it over seven days or, you know, or whatever breakdown, um, is applicable to, to the individual, but to, to spread things out a little bit more. And, and, you know, again, a starting point can be to add frequency. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of uh, back of the napkin math, uh, three times a week, an extra 20 minute workout that adds up to 50 hours per year or more, <laughs> 52 so that's and that's significant for for age group athletes. That can be around ten percent, I guess, of, of the yearly volume that you can add from three more twenty minute sessions per uh, per week. So uh, the next thing that I wanted to discuss is is how to approach the lower intensity sessions, uh, which, uh, as we talked about, are super important now. So, so what's uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, they got to be as slow as they need to be, and I don't think there's really such thing as too slow. Um, again. Uh, the there are some athletes that they're you know the the most i guess the the error that you see is that their easy stuff is too fast um and uh, there's all kinds of different reasons for that and uh, some of it is because we can measure it and so you're looking at the pace it can be people you know now that you can look down in your watch and you can see exactly what pace per k or per mile you're going then um it's tempting to want to increase that um but but we go as slow as we need to go and um you know that can mean, mean some pretty slow running um um riding again it's it's the, the error of too too slow is is not terribly significant when you're training higher frequency and higher volume um so you know rpe yep um go by rpe go as easy as you want to go as easy as the body wants to go um, sometimes we have to tell people to slow down, um, but it's, I would, I don't think I would ever tell somebody to speed up an easy session. Um, so yeah, that, that's how we do it. Um, most of our guys, even the, the, the very, very fast runners are, you know, they're running four thirties, five minutes per K for easy runs, sometimes slower, depending who they are or how tired you are. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think there's, there's no such thing as sort of jump miles in this way it's just all aerobic training and if you need to go slower go slower yeah so uh that's uh, i want to highlight that because that's that's super important to hear that that these guys that are running 28 minutes off the bike in an olympic distance triathlon they are running their easy runs at 432 to five minute uh pace per kilometer that would be uh i guess seven seven fifteen eight minute mile pace for the uh for the imperial uh, listeners so mm. uh, so that's that's something to to keep in mind and and I, I think that another important thing that you mentioned there is that you you run by uh or train by rpe as slow as needed I, I actually just recently had this discussion with with one of my athletes and and told him to to like have, have don't don't have the the watch on a display that that shows pace or anything like that just go by rpe make sure that that the rpe is is really low is is really easy because uh we consistently had had some issues with with too fast and uh, too fast paces, too high powers in in easy easy training. So so I think that's important to to hear and highlight as well. 
Are there differences between the disciplines, uh, I guess, running and, and cycling you already alluded to seem pretty similar. What about swimming? Do you have uh, swim sessions that are completely easy, complete recovery, or or how does that differ in any way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we I mean, I guess the, the difference in, in swimming is the, the technical side of things. You know, how, how is the stroke perhaps different if you're going really easy or really slow but in the end yeah of course we 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 do easy swimming and um don't we mix the strokes only a little bit in the warm-up um but in general you know if we want to swim easier we might put the pool boy in or or you know use use pulling and depending the 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 amount of pulling that they're used to um, but our guys are capable of pulling every day, multiple kilometers. And, and I find that that's a good way when the fatigue is high to, to go pull paddles and you tend to have slightly better mechanics. Um, it's the extra feedback of, uh, pressure on the hand keeps the, the elbow up and the armpit open a little bit more. Um, and, and this is the interesting part about triathlon is is the the interaction between the three sports and of course the 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 swim for for most of the athletes that we're dealing with and most of the athletes in the sport you might describe them low efficiency swimmers and when they're fatigued they slow down their mechanics are are worse their their technique is worse and um and and this is where using various tools to to help that process um, can make a big difference. Uh, you know, the, the the flotation body position from a pool boy can make a difference, and it and allow you to do a little bit more volume with better better techniques. So you have to build up to that. Um, you know, to be able to use um, pool paddles um, with without any issues, but but eventually you can. You know, we have we have some athletes that do ninety percent of their swimming um, pool paddles. Um, and, and others where there's a mix, it depends if they're kind of more kick dominant swimmer, um, from their rhythm or, or not. Um, but, but yeah, that, it, so it is, I guess it's different in that is way. That, is that, is that 90% of their total swimming or 90% of, uh, the, the volume in, in a, an easier session that you mean? Uh, I, that's a, <laughs> a back of the napkin calculation, but it's, it's basically, yeah, of total swimming. Um, we, okay. you know, it, it depends, you know, uh, uh, the, the 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 factor is you know ideally we want to have good quality swimming under high fatigue levels and and that's tricky that's not easy to do and that's where the 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 tools can be useful um for for in order to i guess take more good strokes versus more um um you know drop you know t- if you think of the traditional sort of you know closed armpit dropped elbow kind of you know low propulsion swimming um, you know, this is where the tools come into play in order to, to, to have better quality swimming. But that, that's the one thing I've it really kind of been thinking about more in the last four or five years is the interaction between the three and, and depending, I mean, I suppose a lot of age group and long course, the, the swim, I mean, you put the wetsuit on and you can, you know, you've got to have the endurance to get through it, but it's, it's not, you know, the make or break part of the race. Uh, obviously for professionals and faster and long course, it, it is very important. You need to make the train. Uh, and then in, in the Olympic racing, it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, and so the balance of workload between the three sports is something to, to play with and, and observe and, and watch, um, you know, what you did the day before, how fatigued the legs are, um, you know, it can make such a difference in the the quality that you get, both quality of output and quality, um, you know, technical quality um, can just vary so much based on fatigue. Um, so again, the, the the shortcut around that, if you like, it's not a shortcut really, but is is to is to use the the, the pull paddle tools to to just swim technically better more often, even under heavy fatigue. And do you have some other things that you've uh practically started to apply in training based on what you've discovered and and found out about the interaction of the different disciplines yeah i mean the 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 microcycle template how you know how you how you manage um uh, b- between you know where, where are your key runs and bikes although we tend to follow the same more or less anyway but um 
you know, even, I mean, we tend to not train very early in the morning, for example. And I know some, some athletes, neuromuscular coordination and their just general swimming don't function very early in the morning. I mean, we kind of know when the, in, you know, uh, from the circadian rhythm that there's sort of better periods of the day, although you can't always pick that, um, according to, according to that reason. But, um, but yeah, we, you know, we've, we've played around with the loading the day before we want to swim with, uh, do a harder swim and, and, um, try, I guess just try to protect for some athletes, the, the quality of their output in the water. Um, it, it's not an easy thing because again, you come, come back to where we started the conversation, consistent workload over time, you know, at, at certainly at the top level, there's a, a level of fatigue, a, a general level of fatigue that just stays there. It's just omnipresent, you know, over, you know, you're, they're always a certain level of fatigued. So they're never really fresh when we're in a training block, um, which can be tricky for improving swimming. We, we need to be aware of that. So, you know, we can manipulate the total volume, particularly running. Running has seems to have, you know, the higher, run volume seems to have the most impact on swimming quality. So if you want to, I mean, and we, we know this intuitively as well when, um, you know, if you want to, if you want to see somebody improve their swim or you want to by, by accident anyway, you know, if somebody has got a running injury, usually they're, and they can't run as much or, or at all, uh, often their swimming immediately gets better. And, um, you know, and, and that's just also a function of total training load going down and, and of course, your your quality goes up in, in everything that you do, um, but but just that interaction between um, the goals. So if you've got a if you've got somebody that needs to improve their swimming, then then you might modify their workload on the bike and run to be a little bit less than than what they might otherwise do to have you know more energy for swimming. Um, and even just paying attention to what I was saying before about you know do they swim better in the morning or the afternoon. Um, uh, and and perhaps if you can um, ch- choosing a you know it's most li- most likely going to be the afternoon if they're highly fit they might uh, feel the water feel better neuromuscularly in the afternoon than than the morning but depends what what else you're doing um, again it you know I don't want it to be a cop out of saying it depends all the time but it, but it does about the training load and and what's normal you know some you know, some athletes can do, you know, say, you know, a hundred, hundred K ride in, in the morning and go in in the afternoon and crank out a great five K swim. And another would be destroyed if they did that and they wouldn't get any swimming quality. So again, it, it varies over time and comes back to, you know, the, the big differentiator across athletes is, you know, what kind of intensity they can do under heavy fatigue and under um, high chronic load. Yeah, yeah. I, I've actually, personally, I've played around with this and, and changed it uh, after, after the new year that uh, now I do my swimming in the afternoon and, and I tend to do my my bikes and runs as the primary session, I guess, because for me, my limiter for 7.3 racing, which is now my, my main focus, is, is not, it's not the swim, but it's uh, it's really the run that I, that I really want to focus on improving a lot. And, and I find that when I do a, a 5K swim, even if it's not like the hardest in the world, it really takes away from my running quality in the afternoon. But if I do it the other way around, I can still get a, a good session in usually in the pool in the afternoon, even if I have done a, a hard run. And, and if it's an easy run, then it's no problem at all. So, so yeah, I, I guess that's that's an example of how how playing around with the interactions between between disciplines can play out. But as you say, it, it does depend on what the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the athlete are, and what the objective and the the main things to to improve are as well. Yeah, go ahead. The next thing, the the, the next thing that uh, that I had here to discuss would be the the high intensity sessions and uh, and approaching them. Uh, if you can cover that the way that you sort of covered off the the low intensity sessions yeah uh, uh, i i guess I, I think about this a lot all, all the time as well and and you know one of the interesting things of the ability to share information and and know what the world is doing um that you couldn't do 10 or 20 years ago um you know we tend to f- focus a lot on the speed of sessions and see what others are doing and and um and for me i think it it's i see a over emphasis on over race pace um, work and and I guess you know coming back to the the context of my everyday is is um, 
is the Olympic pathway work and the Olympic distance, so 5K, 10K. Um, perhaps it might apply slightly less over longer distance, but but just the the the, the biggest mistake I see so much is uh, so often is is just um, speeds and intensity that are just far too much, particularly with running far too fast. Um, it seemed like disconnected from anything the athletes will ever face in a competition. Um, one interesting thing about triathlon running is because we do it in a, fati- a pre-fatigue state coming off of the bike, the, the speeds that even the best in the world are doing are attainable sort of by all, you know, that we're not limited by the ability to run, you know, for the, probably the, the 99% anyway are not limited in, in the ability to, to run the speed. It, it's, it's to be fit enough to run it under fatigue and, and resistant to slowing down is, is the more the reality, even the very best men and the women in, in the world in Olympic distance or shorter, the speeds that are going at any point in a 5k or 10k are, are attainable by, by um, athletes of a much lower performance level. Um, and yet um, we, we, you know, we, if you look at, you know, the, the sort of infamous track session, track Tuesdays that are around the world that, that we saw yesterday, you know, and many, many of those athletes will be going far over race pace, far, far faster than anything that they'll face in racing. And and for me, my thought on that is, is just the, the amount of risk that you're taking on board um, when you're ex- exceeding either from a fitness point of view, your biomechanical limits or just how much stress you're putting on your system and what is the, the, the return on that, um, you know, obviously to to some degree you know there's a you know the training stress and response is a continuum so you can have you know it's not don't need to go at a precise pace to get a precise response it doesn't exactly work like that but you know i i just see athletes in general running far too fast uh and it's just uh i think the risk is just really high when you're doing that and and you know biomechanically um you know the, the the biggest problems we're going to have are breakdown of biomechanics and and an injury and 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 where does the problem lie? Is it in the programming that that coaches are prescribing the sessions as ten times four hundred uh, maximum sustainable pace, mm-hmm. or or is it that the athletes want to push themselves? Uh, what, selves, what what do you think? Uh, it's both of those things. You know, I think it. I, where is the starting point? I guess it may perhaps it might be from a a different understanding of what triathlon running is, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not about the speed, quote unquote speed. It's about endurance and fitness and conditioning. Um, you know, so what, where, you know, if, what is the route to, to get there? You know, if you're, you know, if your goal is running three minutes a K off a bike, do you, you know, how much time do you need to spend running substantially over that? You know, I mean, that's an interesting question to think about. Um, you know, but mostly I see just a disconnection from reality, you know, um, dream paces, not reality paces, you know, dream intensities, not reality paces. I think if, if you want to become a three minutes per K off the bike runner, and you're currently 315, you don't get there by running a bunch of three minutes per K because that's the wrong intensity for you with your current fitness level. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Intensity is not, uh, is not, is not so pr- precise. You know, you have to train at the intensity that's right for you today, uh, and your current level and, um, and, and you progress from that. And, uh, you know, so, uh, I think it's just the easiest thing to overdo and it's the easiest correction to make is, is is make your your uh, in, intensive sessions appropriate for your current level, your current fatigue level, and build in uh, a room for a, a buffer, if you like. You know, again, intensity. Your body is not a, a machine that has a precise threshold pace. You know, your 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 virtual threshold, if you like, changes every day based on your fatigue, based on stress, based on environmental conditions, it, hydration, all kinds of things affect this, right? And you know, if you get in the zone, more or less, then you're going to get a kind of response from that. Um, but it doesn't need to be a precise and it doesn't need to be at the fastest part of that range. And and that's what we tend to want to do. And the more we can disconnect our ego from that, the better, 
you know, um, we all know and in, in coaching and in even as an athlete watching other athletes, the, the training champions who are, you know, they lay down in, in incredible sessions, but we never see anything like that from them in races. And that's a big part of why, you know, it, our, you know, if you're pushing to the limit all the time in training, then you, you're, you're not training optimally in the sense of what's likely to be sustainable for you or what's the right intensity that you can recover from uh, consistently and, and, um, and, and over time, what's the right dose. And uh, I came across this one concept of this, like the minimal effective dose. And uh, when I, when I first heard that, um, you know, my, my response was uh, perhaps, Oh, well, you know what we shouldn't think about minimum we should think about max maximizing performance so we can't have minimum but over time i uh, the concept um resonated more and more you know in the sense of what is the the minimum dose that gets us the response we want that then if you can add on top of that that you can do consistently over time and um and and i like that concept because in practice you know every day you can you can see that what when's the right time to finish a session is not when you're at the limit and you know you're at the track and you've got to you know you're laying on the track or being sick or or you know just the feeling of being destroyed that that those are all signs you've you've probably exceeded the minimum of minimum dose to get the response you want um uh, but but finish feeling like you could have done more you know that, that again it, in the big picture um, if you could have done uh, 12 reps, but you do 10 of whatever, it's not a big deal. But if, if, if you, if you exceed that point, uh, you can run into problems and, uh, uh, you know, and again, coming back to like the big picture, um, avoiding injury and illness is just fundamental to consistent, um, improvement and, and achieving your potential. And, uh, what are the biggest problems that we encounter? The biggest mistakes I've made in my coaching, the biggest, um, errors we can see is, is athletes that get into an injury and illness cycle. Um, you know, the, the best, the best way to avoid future injury is, uh, is right here in the present. And, and in fact, the best predictor of somebody that's going to be injured in the future is somebody that's had a past injury. Um, cause it can be very difficult to exit those cycles because of how, how good our bodies are at compensating. We end up with all kinds of secondary issues. Um, and given sort of the, the typical endurance athlete mentality, you know, stubborn, um, keep, you know, re- reluctant to rest, uh, you know, athletes can, can end up with quite deep compensation patterns, which can be really difficult to unpick. And, uh, and I think where does that come from? It's often just from really um, not being disciplined with pace control, not being disciplined with um, management of high intensity. It's it's where we're most likely to go wrong. Um, and the impact is the biggest in running, but also in cycling. You know, um, it, you know, there's obviously less biomechanical uh, risk, but uh, in the same way, um, you know, it's easy to cook yourself by by pushing too hard uh, and too often. Um, and um, again, perhaps slightly less in swimming, but it's all connected to the same of discipline about where you're currently at, you know, what's the right intensity for you now and, um, and, and allowing yourself a range and not needing to be at the top end of that, but being quite comfortable at the lower end. And if you can't do the lower end, then, you know, you need to change a session and do something else, um, do a different kind of session. Um, we were on the track the other day, we had an athlete that clearly wasn't quite adapting to the reps that the group was doing. And we changed the duration of the reps so that that they could have more recovery. And then we continued along as an example of a modification right during a session. And, you know, the, the willingness and comfort level to do that uh, and recognizing that's not a failure of training. um, That's just a necessary adaptation. And in fact, that's both, I suppose, um, good decision making an example of good decision making and and what coaching is about as well and and it's not the easiest to for athletes to learn how to do that um but in the right environment and reinforcement then you know we that that's what you want to see ultimately with with a self-coached athlete is to be able to understand what's enough what's the what what when to stop uh, when to stop if it's um not feeling right or if it, if the if the rp is is um, out of uh, expectation, you know, then they willing to stop. Um, and I think in, in that sort of model, if you think about 
endurance sport and that model, then, um, you know, I think that that way of thinking is going to lead you to be more consistent over time. And, uh, you know, it's not about sticking to the program and, and um, you know, you must do whatever intensity or you have to hit your key sessions. But but these are just doses of intensity that you can do or not do. But if you do the fundamentals of frequency, uh, volume consistently, <laughs> again, um, you know, and again, that's not over just, you know, a week or two, but over months, that's that's where I think you start to see that. And, and we know that when we look at chronic load charts as well, it's, you know, the, the acute load, it really does mean acute, but the chronic, you know, you can build that up over weeks and months and you can see the impact. And, and you also see how stable that becomes. Um, and, and, you know, the chronic load that a lot of us are, you know, would be thinking about um, may come from um, the training s- stress score model from power data. And the point is perhaps not even whether that is the best way to think about it, because those are I mean, I wouldn't say they're entirely arbitrary, but they, they have content constants that have been uh, decided, you know, um, which may or not may not be the most valid. But the, the idea is still good that, you know, over, you know, uh, a month or two months, your your average workload uh, over time, that's that's what a base or a foundation looks like, you know, a, a robust um, chronic load um, sets you up for success and, and allows you to manage intensity as well. So, um, you know, all of that stuff is connected, but it's all coming back to like, how, how do you, what I think is the most important is how do you, how do you manage those higher intensity doses and are you getting that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, fantastic answer. So many things that, that resonate there. I, I think that one of the things that I really want to highlight is that, uh, that thing that you said about leaving the session feeling like you you could have done a couple more intros if you if you had wanted to and and also and that it's okay to be at the lower end of that that range that you're trying to hit that you you're not necessarily going for the the very upper end and you're certainly not trying to beat any given time and and that is i guess in my coaching what i see uh, as perhaps the biggest problem is that athletes consistently try to push to get to that very upper end of uh, of a given intensity range or trying to beat it so so that's uh that's something that uh that i think it's it's great that you you highlighted there uh another follow-up question that i had is what are your thoughts on uh, how to place the i guess intense workouts during the week how much recovery between intense workouts in different disciplines uh etc can you talk about how you how you place them in the micro cycle i guess yeah i mean we we, we follow uh i guess a fairly uh, traditional but it depends how I guess whether what the listeners know about the the the, the global triathlon model, but but it it's often um, around the world very similar in that sort of Tuesdays and Saturdays end up being specific run sessions uh, or intensive run sessions, more intense run sessions. Uh, at various times of the year, we do something on Thursday, a run off the bike, or or some hills, or something of a smaller dose, or just easy, depending. Um, where we are now is 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 we we tend to take Thursday easy if we need to, but those two days and and um, the 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 swim um, typically again we do usually two um, harder or higher intensity sessions and um, and and with the bike as well. Um, it depends on the terrain. Like if we're in a place with a lot of hills or at altitude or very windy. Um, at different times of the year, we may do one or no specific sessions because we get enough natural intensity due to those other factors. But um, it's often going to be two of each in, e- in, in each sport. And um, I think I find more than that is hard to sustain or or, or um, is very difficult to sustain. Uh, less than that is okay. You don't have to do up. You don't have to do two. Um, but but um, yeah, we we might. You know, in in that model, we might um, we often swim a, a, a solid swim on the same day as the track session, uh, also on a Tuesday, um, where the other one might be um, typically on a, on a Friday, um, which is, um, is is where where it might be the only intensive session, and then the rides can be depending on the on the cycle we're in. It could be Wednesday, Friday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Sunday. Um, but, but it depends where, where we're at overall and, um, in, in the training load. 
Um, but but I tried to spread them out. But I mean, that's the interesting part about triathlon is is whereas a you know only a single sport, um, it is it's much more clear or simple to spread out intensive sessions. Uh, and that's where we can come back to that like interaction between the three. And, um, you know, I, I know, for example, like if we, if we, if we do a hard, well, if we do a track session or if we do a run session the next day, depending whether we did the track session or the run session in the morning or the afternoon, the next day may not be a great swimming day to expect quality or at least, um, um, sustain quality. So, you know, as we often do Tuesday evening run session, uh, Wednesday swim will have to be um, not so much of a quality session. It might be a cruise swim, endurance swim, or recovery swim uh, as a connection to that to that run session. Yeah, um, I think around the cycling, it, it depends. It depends on the fitness level, and um, but but it's just you know you. I guess there's different ideas about it. You can you can try to stack them together. You know, do you know like say two 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 hard sessions on one day, and then a. Um, a a lighter middle day. I, I try to spread them out depending, but, but we, we, we typically take a easy, easier Monday. Um, and then the Tuesday, some intensive sessions, Wednesday might be longer aerobic, um, in all three. And the Thursday depends whether we're in a specific phase or a more general phase. Um, so spreading them out, um, in general, I think is, is, um, useful. And, um, I, I like the the doing int- I mean it may be sort of self evident but do, doing in intensive sessions on on the weekend as a, just a model for a rhythm going into a race so we we do both intensive sessions on Saturday and Sunday or or high workload sessions uh, as a model for 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 racing um so we don't have to change the microcycle when we go into a race week or out of a race week uh, so it's it's consistent in that way um, you know, obviously I'm aware and thinking, you know, always thinking about different micro cycles and certainly where more recently, these shorter ones have become more, more trendy. Um, again, like three and one or uh, some kind of mix of not seven day cycles. Um, <clears throat> from my side, when I, when I look at that and experiment with that, I think I find the athletes like the predictability of, if it's a Tuesday, we do this. If it's a Wednesday, we do that. And, and then there's a rhythm to that. And that takes away a little bit of the, the uncertainty and, um, and the, I, I think that the uncertainty or the change has an energy cost. And, and so I look at it in that way, that predictability, the rhythm, the routine is partly how you maintain high training load um, because there's a flow to things. And, um, obviously seven day microcycle is arbitrary, but it's arbitrary in the sense that's the way that society works. So it's not that, you yeah, know, arbitrary it's, it's in the built, sense of it's built into us from a very young age. So, so it's difficult course, to change yeah. that. Yeah. But, but, uh, you know, when, again, you know, so the, the argument goes both ways. It's like, well, why should you do a seven day cycle and, uh, versus four days, you know, three and one or eight days or, or something else. And, and I think in, in, there, there are perhaps not one way to do this, but my thought on this, why I've settled on this, is the predictability and the rhythm and the routine, um, and the practicality of of places where, um, you know, you've got you're dependent on facilities of access. It's useful to have a predictable routine, and I think it, it it's easier on the athletes when they know what to expect. You know, in in partly the environment you know that we that we try to create is is one where it's easier for the athletes to sustain a high workload and how, partly how we do that is by providing a framework around the work that reduces their requirement to make decisions and um and 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 that's a big part of the we're outsourcing they don't need to decide when to show up to swim because we have it structured it's a schedule there's a rhythm, there's a routine to it. They know uh, on a Tuesday, it's going to, this is what to expect. This is what we do. And, and that flow is important, I think, to sustain over time, uh, consistent training. 
Sure. Yeah. And a final follow up on, on this, on the intense sessions, what is, you've alluded to it uh, quite a lot already, but, but if you can uh, describe a little bit how you use, what sort of intensity zones you are trying to hit in the different sessions that you, you have in, in the week, like what's your preference for, for that? Yeah. I mean, in the, in the swimming, we, we've kind of, it's evolved over time just to be, um, a, a solid hard effort you know it's as simple as that and it's self-evident based on the duration of the repetitions we're doing you know whether if it's a longer repetition then the intensity will be adjusted accordingly um intensity meaning actual output speed um but but you tend to just keep it really simple like uh, you know um solid this is going to be a solid swim we're going to swim hard and this is the set and and you do the set according to the energy you've got and we monitor the output and decide how much you know whether to change it or or adapt it if they're not able to do it or if they're um slowing down or or not or if they blow up then we can we can adapt that in uh, for the swim um so it, it's perhaps in in the end it's all going to end up being very similar you know um the paces don't change that much of course going from off season building fitness to a stable level of fitness then um you know the output's not going to change that much you know for you know o- only based on fatigue and energy is it going to significantly be different um the riding we do a lot based on group efforts so we don't end up riding to a output like a, a a power output the power will be looked at um after the fact um but if we're doing hills or a group effort last last week we we did um a crit session and it's just you know cir- circuits with a lot of corners and we just ride them more or less at at a race intensity and that's all we need to say and we, we get what we need to out of that with a really simple description of that um, when we were riding hills, we just did um, various different kinds of progressions building. You know, if we did six by whatever hill reps, then um, we almost always progress into everything that we're doing, um, uh, whether, whether it be running or um, cycling or, or, or swimming. Almost everything is a progression. And although that may be counterintuitive in the sense of, well, races don't start like that. They, they start full gas, um, at least in short distance racing, they do. Um, however, again, under, under high workload, under high fatigue, uh, allowing the body to sort of work into it, letting the athlete to work into it, um, I think gets the best results in the end. I mean, in, in, in the sense of, what kind of output could we get on any given day, allowing the athlete to sort of build into it, find their rhythm, find their pace, um, and finish well, finish the best we can, um, or according to the goal of the session is the most effective way to do that. Um, I think you're most likely going to hit the sweet spot of in terms of what the athlete could do the right amount. If you, if you do it like that, um, especially under high fatigue, um, if you ask them to do high intensity right from the, beginning um you, you may they may crack physically or mentally earlier than and and you will end up with having less work done than you might otherwise so almost everything we do um, as a progression and i think it, it it tends towards also how do we want to race we want to finish well we want to be in control and, and be strong at the end and uh, it's probably a good mental model uh, from from that point of view um but coming back to the running, the running is where it's a little different. The running, we always have pace controls and it's usually speed limits. Um, again, the, the biggest problem we have is just going too fast. So almost every session we do, we'll run to a pace range or a, or a speed limit. So no faster than whatever per K or per, per 400 if we're, on a, if we're on the track or shorter. And, um, and again, that doesn't change that much. And, and we know more or less we're going to get the right amount of work from that, um, from that approach. So that's where it's different. The running is different than the, than the others where we, we can have more of a, a, a perceived effort uh, output. Um, and from the running, I want them to manage that and be more disciplined about that because of the, the risks of overdoing it are higher. 
Um, so, so we tend to, and, and that doesn't even change that much over time. In fact, we repeat a lot of the exact same sessions and progressions year after year. Um, and even as the athletes get a bit faster, I mean, cause there's ways to manage that as well. If you're running in a group, um, you know, there's a the difference between setting the pace and following the pace is, is enough that it can make a difference, uh, for different, slightly different levels of athletes. But I mean, that we sort of, you know, the athletes converge on the demands of the race. So in terms of pacing, um, obviously we don't want athletes to be running with a group, but over, over, um, over exerting themselves relative to the others that that's a, a training error that we try to avoid, although it's difficult because ego gets caught up into that. Um, so we usually, usually the way around that is to have a plan from the beginning to, to manage that. Uh, rather than let the athlete sort of feel it out, um, like seeing how it goes is not always the best policy with running. It's better to say, let's start at this pace and let's see where we can increase from there. But this is, and, and with the goal of achieving, uh, you know, a, a, a slightly faster pace as we're working through the whatever session it is. So um, where I started with that some years ago, I think was, um, I mean, I haven't looked at it in, in years since then, but um, using the Daniel's running formula and the, the V dot as sort of a, a mental model for that. Um, you know, if you're, if, I don't know if everyone's familiar with that. Most but of them are. It's, it's, it's been mentioned several times and, and we can link to it in the show notes as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, V dot roughly equivalent to like a VO2 max, which could be correlated to uh, PBs across various distances. It's not exactly that but cl- close enough uh and and according to v dot then you'll have pace ranges for for different intensities so um i mean it's standard i suppose in the sense of zones training zones to elicit whatever response you you're, you're after um so again in, it, it tend to 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 work primarily you know when i think of wh- where's the biggest volume coming it's it's under race pace over over volume under race pace tend tend to be where we spend a little bit more of our time because again i think under under high chronic load and under high fatigue that's probably the the least risky type of work um and then when we go to the track we tend to run over pace but obviously un- under volume so what we almost never do is sort of the stereotype 10 by a K at race at 10 K race pace. Um, and the thought with that is just, that's the, the highest kind of workload session that you would t- tend to do. And, you know, in terms of the most specific, um, but doing that kind of session in the context of your quote unquote 30 hours a week is really difficult um in the same way that doing sort of vo2 max work in the context of middle high high chronic load period is really difficult to execute without really high risk and in fact they may not be able to do it because they may be too fatigued to do that um so pace control and and um you, you know manage you know i think it's it's useful to be a comfortable running over race pace biomechanically. You don't want that to become a limiter, but we don't want, I wouldn't want to overemphasize that either. There's, you know, there's, there's, um, I mean, I, I come across stores all the time and, and, you know, sessions that other coaches and athletes tell me that are just substantially faster than anything I would have our guys do. Um, and yet obviously there, the, those athletes are not at the performance level of the same as some of the guys in, in our environment. But yet they're doing intensity that is higher and uh, higher speed and higher workload than than we would do. I think again some of that comes back to where we started in the whole context of um, what's interesting about the top athletes is that they can do a kind of intensity and, and a level of workload of intensity within the context of the of the high chronic load. Um, it, it, anybody, quote unquote, anybody can do high intensity under low uh, chronic load. Um, that's not what, that's not interesting to me. It's what they can do under, under high load sustainably. That's where the differentiators come into play, um, and where you can see the difference. So, you know, when my experience again, over time, when we're talking about intensity, the, the best athletes in the world, um, are not the ones that are doing the most necessary necessarily the ones that are doing the most impressive sessions 
So you could walk onto the track and you could see whatever sessions anywhere from, you know, Brownlees to, to Whitfield back in Canada to in, in, anybody, you, you name them. The, the sessions in often are not something that you think is just, you know, extraordinarily fast. That's, that's not the point. It's, can you do that session when you're highly fatigued uh, consistently that, you know, that type of output and that's where quick, very quickly you see most athletes can't, and that's what the differentiator is. Mm, yeah, great points. C- can you just clarify? Because I, I'm, uh, I was still a bit unclear on uh, when you said about uh, about under race pace, or I guess you meant faster than race pace when you when you go to the track and do running, but you still have that speed limit, so so it's not uh, like incredibly fast. But but then did you say that on the on the swim and the bike you do more of uh, like at race pace or or slower than race pace uh, but but you try to do more volume or did i did i get that wrong because i wasn't quite clear on that um i, I guess what i'm saying that the the precision of um of the the way that we set up the sessions is for running is is about is about um speeds and 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 and, and paces and and for cycling and swimming we tend to use more um Uh, subjective uh, measures yeah. so yeah. Just, just hard or solid or you know quote you know r- race effort m- mid-race effort we could say um because the the dynamics are different in the in this yeah. pool you know i think going by effort um because the day-to-day variation of speed is going to be sl- slightly more due to the impact of fatigue on mechanics So, you know, you can have a, a good session holding 110s or it can be a good session holding 106s. Uh, and one of them is going to be because they were more fresh than the other. It doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't do a good session in, the, in either case. Yeah. Um, and, and what's your preference for the kind of, uh, I guess, total duration of the main set in the swim? Like, do you do, you do like the faster, like 1,000 meter main sets or do you like to do longer main sets with... 2000 to 3000 meter main sets I, and and same for the bike you mentioned six repetitions on hills is that six times three minutes or six times 10 minutes like do, or do you mix it up and, and really have from both sides of the spectrum yeah we, i tend to to follow just a, a progression also over time so in the beginning of the you know when we when we're ready to start intensity we'll do our smaller volume of intensity and and then we'll gradually increase that volume of intensity until a certain point doesn't continue forever um you know in in it depends how you know in the in the in the swim it could be you know as little as you know 400 meters of of hard swimming at the beginning to you know two to three k's main set of of a variety of paces or or consistent solid i mean um probably we wouldn't do much more than that of a main set all solid or all hard effort but but in that in that range we we don't have a lot of fluff in our sets we always do the same warm up we do 800 then we do some kind of preset and then we'll have a main set of between 2 and 4k and then a cool down um so there's there's not a lot of extras in there um in terms of um a volume um or or easy swimming but just long long main sets i think is the the key to to triathlon swimming don't don't fluff around too much with with um a lot of different things and, and probably for age groupers as well like you know if you if you if you've got an hour to swim make the most of that hour don't spend too much time um uh doing you know non-specific things i think you know in in general you know and that's a difference perhaps between sort of masters programs or or you know, club swimming where there's, you know, they get, they're going to be in there for two hours. They can't do two hours of main sets. They end up having a lot of fluff. And um, this, I don't, I don't think is very effective in triathlon um, because, because we enter in such a typically a fatigued state or pre fatigued state from, from whatever we did the day before or, or the same day. Uh, I don't think that sort of the extra, mileage in the pool is always a value because you can end up just swimming technically poor um as a result so that's perhaps counterproductive um for for triathlon swimming um but but yeah so and and the cycling it depends if we're doing if it's a solo session or if it's by if it's a group session and there's the dynamics of a group like we did a 
you know, a, a, a bunch effort where we had five guys rotating through for a period of time, you know, that you can't really, I mean, we just give it a, a, a label like mid race, mid race effort, you know, so not the beginning, um, but once you settle in, what is that? And they know more or less what the power output's going to be, you know, um, so they, they know how to do that. I mean, obviously we're, these guys are very experienced in this way, but, but it doesn't need to be more specific than that. We don't say, well, you've got to achieve a certain output. It depends on the wind, it depends on the hills, um, depends how they're feeling, um, you know, the interaction between the athletes, they, you know, if they, some, some might need to, to sit in a couple of turns and, and others might take longer, uh, longer pulls. Um, so often for, for cycling, again, it, it's more on, RP or, or according to the effort that we want to do. But, you know, if we are doing it like a progression, um, session, we, you know, we, a couple of weeks ago, we were doing long climbs. It was about 15 minute climbs. We did, we did three and we just said, let's, let's progress from, from the first to the third. And so, um, uh, the athlete can figure out what's the best way to do that uh, based on their energy levels and using the other guys to to push themselves and um and I know if as long as they don't start too hard we're going to achieve more or less what we want then and and so that that's close enough that's keeping it simple enough and and kind of in a way to avoid making a, an error in the sense of an athlete blowing up or or having a session where their confidence is knocked because they tr- tried to do too much, you know, um, the, you know, that, that's a, I suppose thing that we didn't talk about, but it's all connected to this is trying to set up sessions to be successful, to be perceived as successful um, is really important because, you know, athletes, if you give them a session, they assume that you're giving it to them because they, because you think that they can do it. And so if they can't do it, then, you know, they think that they failed where actually probably, you know, 99% of the time it's the coach that's failed because they've, they've failed to anticipate what was possible on the day. And, um, but the athlete is the one that ends up feeling bad about that often, right? They, I couldn't do what the coach said, I th- uh, what the coach thought I could do. So I failed somehow my, and that, therefore my confidence is down or, um, I couldn't do what the coach thought I needed to be able to do. Um, which is also an error in thinking. Um, you know, we we get that wrong more than the athletes do. It's particularly, you know, if we're t- thinking about the context of coaches working with adults who have chosen to do what they're doing. Um, you know, they're typically highly motivated people. Um, in probably the majority of coaching context, the you know the the athletes we're working with have self selected that they're already motivated. And uh, we always have to assume high motivation, even when they're fatigued. Of course, that affects generally our, our acute motivation, but they're they're still highly motivated people. So we always have to assume that that they want to do whatever it is that you know you set the objective as. So I think it's partly also our job in connecting all of this is to anticipate what they ought to be able to do, given everything you know about the context, the chronic load, the acute load. Uh, what you know about the profile of the athlete. We want to set them up to be successful in their program. So I think also how we think about um, prescribing work, it should be according to what we believe they can do in order to build up their confidence as well. And in, in an authentic way, we're not we're not um, trying to falsely build their confidence, but we want them to be successful in their training. And we can do that by ant- anticipating what they can do on any given day. And I suppose that's what we do when we write a program. We think, what what can they do? At least that's one way to look at it. What can they do this week? What should they be able to do on this Tuesday, knowing we're week five in this cycle of, um, of progression? And that means, you know, when I think about that, I think it, that that's also saying that the workouts needn't always get harder or bigger because over time, um, just doing the same amount of work, the same workload in any particular day is, is, you know, still, it's a good thing. You know, if, if they can, if they can consistently do the same workload over five, six weeks in a row, um, under ever increasing chronic load, you know, that's also a context to, to improvement. Um, so it doesn't need to always get harder and faster, you know, in that, in that way. I think if you're thinking of endurance training in this model, um, 
overload can be from a chronic way or over not overload in the sense of too much load but but building chronic load build you know what's the stimulus to improve it's that 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 progression over time but it doesn't need to be progression in that every week has to be longer or faster or harder than the week before that's actually not that's not sustainable so you you know that's when you reach this sort of sweet spot for how much work you can do what can you do consistently and you vary that according to how they seem to be adapting and managing and the better you get at that process the more likely that you can predict what they're going to be able to do so that they feel successful and they feel they're able to do what you think that they can do and and hopefully over time they they learn to you know where where confidence should come from is you know when we talk about process and trusting the process and buying into this process that they know if they do this work over time then they're going to maximize their rate of improvement and they're going to um have a the most predictable performance when when they want to um instead of you know a different model is continuing to test them over time but doing that not being so confident in your own process i mean that's part of it and then also breaking the consistency that's the other side of kind of the 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 test model the interrupt the chronic load to test um is is not in my view it's not trusting your own process uh in order to get the outcomes that you want Mm, yeah okay so i'm ready to move on to the rapid fire questions but before we do do you have anything else that we haven't talked about that uh, that you want to add this has been really great and we've been going on for a long time and and i've actually skipped quite a lot of the questions and topics that i wrote down but uh what we've covered so far has been has been absolutely fantastic but if there's anything that we missed that you think would be important to convey uh this is uh the, your chance to do to do so <laughs> just, just just thinking a couple of points and maybe rapid fire on this i think brick workouts from the point of view of time efficiency for age groupers good brick workouts from the point of view of um necessary to run faster off the bike not so important i think we're there's not actually a lot that we're training that's different there i find running off the bike the very first time of the year the athletes can go as fast as they could ever want to go i don't think we're really training anything there other than psychology uh, which is not insignificant but that that is something to think about uh and then peaking uh i think we just way way overdo considering peaking from a from a performance point of view for any level of athlete i think just being consistently aerobically fit and a stable level of conditioning is going to get you almost everything that you could want in this in sport uh, rather than trying to shoot for the one the extra one you know the proverbial one percent i think is uh is not necessary to achieve uh top performance in sport i think we, we want predictable stable performances and and so much of the time showing up to the start line healthy with energy not having cooked yourself is like 99 percent of performing to what you you could hope from yourself rather than hoping or expecting for something that you've never done before um uh, because you've pushed you know typically pushed too hard so i i, I like the concept of Let's just try to get stable, consistent, and predictable performances and not worry too much about peaking. Great perspectives. Uh, All right, so uh, rapid-fire questions, 15 seconds or less to answer these. And the first one is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to triathlon or endurance sports? I don't have something immediate, but the the starting point, I think, would be reading back some Arthur Lydiard um concept uh for for running and and applying that to triathlon so there's some some quite old books about that running to the top Uh, there's even one about uh, adapting that for swimming which to me resonate resonated a lot and something i sometimes uh, come back to what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success I think just being as committed as the athletes, um, if, you know, you got to walk the talk. And if, if you, if you, if you talk about commitment, you've got to demonstrate that. And I think that's what we do sort of living and training together throughout the year. And who's somebody in triathlon that you look up to? I think with, with a young sport, 
um, like ours, when I think of, you know, who I looked up to, it's actually the, the athletes that I get the opportunity to work with. And I'm perhaps somewhat unique in, in that respect to have get to learn from some top, top athletes. But but when I think of all the different athletes from from Simon Whitfield to many of the British athletes to the athletes I've got now, those are the that people in triathlon that I look up to in the sense that have learned the most from. Perfect. And uh, finally, where can uh, people follow you and uh, and yeah, what you have uh, going on? Yeah, we're we're trying to share a lot of the the everyday um, process. We I use Instagram, so if you look up Joel Filial on Instagram. Um, stories, uh, what we're doing. We, we've made some videos here um, about our training. We're experimenting with that, but I mean, we tend to focus on just doing the job of coaching every day. But we've, I've got a YouTube channel with some videos um, that we've made, and um, yeah, follow the the podcast. Um, all of that linked on my web personal website, joefilial dot com, and uh, I, I like uh, when people send in questions and general enthusiasm keeps me uh, motivated to set aside time to uh, revive the podcast and hopefully keep it going yeah the name of the podcast is the real coaching podcast so people can find it but we'll also link to link to that and as you said it's it's on your website as well thank you so much joel it was uh, a real pleasure and thank you so much for your uh, generous uh, use of of time for for us tonight it was uh, it was fantastic to talk to you thanks for having me enjoyed the chat All right, so I really, really hope that uh, now you understand why I was so excited when I introduced this interview to you. For me, this is definitely one of those very few interviews that I know that I will go back and listen to again and again and again, because there's just so much value, so much fantastic advice in it. And I'm, I'm not going to pick, uh, pick out any key takeaways, because I think that everything that we discussed here are key takeaways, really, because all of these things are... Uh, the fundamental things that that you need to uh, get right, nail, nailing the basics, so to say, and uh, so so it's. I don't want to highlight one thing above another. I just want to say, go back and listen to it one time, two times, three times, and go to the show notes page as well. Go to thattriathlonshow dot com and and click through to this specific episode and read through that and. And just, I guess, take uh, take a few moments to sit down and think about what you heard, and and if uh, there is anything that you might might change in your training as a result of of all of this advice that we heard. If you are new to the podcast and you want to make sure that you get all the new episodes as they are released, remember we have episodes every Monday and Thursday. Then please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss anything. And if you have been with us for a long, long time and uh, you love this show and you love interviews like this, uh, then please consider leaving a rating and review because that really helps a lot and uh, helps me keep doing this uh, this show and keep doing it consistently. I try to be as consistent with uh, the podcast as uh, we all should be with our training as discussed in this interview. But those ratings and reviews, they really do help because without growing the show, it uh, would be very difficult to to warrant the time that it uh, really is required to to put out two episodes per week. So, uh, so if you enjoy the show, please uh, leave a rating and review on iTunes or your podcast app, whichever app you're using. Finally, massive thank you to our sponsors that keep the show going. First, we have Roka that you can find on roka.com. Get 20% off your entire order by using the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. You can use that for wetsuits, dry suits, any triathlon or swim apparel, uh, eyewear, uh, performance sunglasses. The fantastic uh, R1 goggles and uh, many other things that I've talked about in in past episodes as well. So check it out on roca.com. And thank you to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Remember to go and take that free online sweat test to get your individual uh, hydration strategy for racing. But it also includes uh, some great advice for how to use the product in training. And they have a great blog as well with lots of great content, quite quite detailed and, and uh, in-depth content. So I really like Precision Hydration's blog. You can get your first box of Precision Hydration product for free when you use the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlons.